It's time for us to get started tonight. Got some announcements we need to make before we get get into our service. Sometime. May I have your attention, please? That's all right. Hey, hey everybody, it's time to get started. We do. I want to make some announcements here because there's some folks here in the family news that... Uh, we need to make everybody aware of that have been listed since Sunday. Uh, we want to remember Mary Ann um, will have foot surgery on Tuesday at 8 o'clock. Donnie says this one's a little more extensive than the first one, so we need to make sure we remember her. And Miss Brenda, last night, um, had to go to the emergency room. She has an infection, bad infection in her chest. She's at home now, but we want to remember her. Homer Dudley um, and Joe Reed, we need to keep remembering our prayers. He's better now. Um, he had a swallowing issue, and I think they maybe, I don't know what that procedure's called, stretch his esophagus. Sounds, sounds painful, but anyway, but he is better. Uh, Shelly Gann, need to con, uh, continue to remember her in our, in our prayers. Um, she has some major blockages uh, in, her, in her heart. Uh, Mike Glenn, still on the prayer list. Um, Michelle Kennedy's father, um, need to continue to remember him in our prayers. Joe Johnson, he's still there. Um, again, Mr. Joe needs our prayers. Louis Pickard, the little boy from Carol's uh, school, he's just a little fella and he's still seriously ill. Lillian Plumley uh, is in the hospital with a, a, a severe infection. I didn't know about that until just tonight. Uh, Scott Spencer, Chris Martell's friend, uh, also has had a heart attack. And Linda Walker, David Walker's sister, was diagnosed with some serious uh, a brain tumor. Is there anybody else, Chris? Kim Craigwald? Kim Craigwald? Yeah, I know, but wow. I, I didn't know. Okay, yeah, but I, I didn't know that it had taken that kind of turn. I hate to hear that. They worshipped at Philadelphia, didn't they? Didn't they? I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, Christine. I can't hear you, Chris. Uh uh, no. Okay. Okay. Ronnie, did you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. Cindy saw that on Facebook. I don't know whether we need to call DCS or <laughs> or the softball commissioner, but whatever. Anybody else comes to mind? I hadn't got anybody assigned to leave. Yeah, Jonathan, did you have your? Yeah, okay. You know, okay, all right. I, the name sounded familiar. I've heard, okay, thanks. Jen, do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, the lady that passed away on the square yeah. um, was actually the wife of, of Jim under the Jim Crow Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Okay, that's a terrible story. Kevin, do you? Uh, yeah, there's uh, either her mother or her grandmother works with uh, Jerry Ann out in uh, San Diego. Saint. South side, south side. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, also, uh, Joe Johnson got good news today. Uh, all the tests that came back, he does not have seizures. He's not had epilepsy. Good. Yeah, David. Well, I was just 
good. Okay, good. Anybody? Yeah, well, I told him that the Mr. Homer's better. Yes. Much better. Yeah. Anybody else need to bring up to speed? No. Chris, can I lead it? Lean on you to lead us in prayer tonight. I tell you what, Chris, do you want to lead us in the song first? Go ahead. That'd be fine.
Everybody had a decent week so far. Pretty good. That song, and there's some other songs too that always remind me about, they have birds, talks about birds in it. My truck, I don't drive it very often because it's a gas guzzler and it's old. But um, I tried to get it the other day and it wouldn't start. So I get out my battery charger and when I opened up the hood, it was like a little bird condominium under there. There was, um, I don't know what kind of birds they are, the little brown and white birds, but anyway, there was like three or four nests on there. There was one on top of my, the reservoir for my squirter, my windshield wiper squirter. There was one on top of the alternator, there was one right on top of the, the breather, and of course there's poop all under there too. So I had noticed it on the tires, on the top of the tires, but I don't know how many of them are living under there. So anyway. Cindy got mad at me. I, I threw all the nest out. She says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Well, i got to drive my truck. What am I supposed to do? All a bunch of birds down the road? Anyway, between those and the boar bees eating my deck up, it may be my father's world, but the, the birds and the bees, are they're ruling the roost. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. It's a passage that I have marked in my Bible for various reasons. Paul says here, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. Your version may read that are violent, people that are violent, unbelieving. It's a pretty broad statement when you think about what Paul says here, to the pure, all things are pure. But if you're vile and unbelieving or an unbeliever, nothing is pure. You know somebody, and I have some people that come to my mind, that can take maybe the... <clears throat> one of God's um, good and perfect gifts or something that is pure and or anything else in their lives and as soon as they touch it, they taint it or contaminate it. You know anybody like that? They're toxic. Um, it could be a relationship. It could be you know somebody in their family or maybe somebody that they, they care about. It could be in the workplace. It could be in the church. But they can take something that is intended to be good and turn it into something bad because Paul says here they're vile and they're unbelieving, that, that there are things that they just can't, for some reason in their mind, whether it's, it's the devil has got them so deep that they don't appreciate things that are pure, that they defile it. We're going to talk about some of this tonight. The reason I, I, I started with this, we'll look at some in Galatians. There's some, a passage there that enumerates several things that we'll talk about. But I, I guess tonight the lesson is this. We live in a world that... Um, that things that, that are pure are not valued very much. Purity is something, um, especially spiritually speaking, um, that's it's a rare thing anymore. You know, if you even think about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it was delivered and presented to us for, for all mankind, and what people have done, or the devil has done through people, as far as making even the gospel of Jesus Christ something that is just not pure anymore. Um, we should always be thankful, and of course it's the, the church of our Lord, it's our call and that's our cry, is to be that pure, um, nothing added to, essential church that Jesus Christ came here and, and died for us to have. In that effort, sometimes it's difficult when we live in a world, and especially when people want to maybe change things to suit their own needs, to keep the gospel message pure. But here's the lesson. There is nothing more important for us as Christians or the church to do today than to keep the gospel message pure. It's got to be pure. It's got to be unadulterated. Because if you take, start taking from or adding to it, then it, it loses its, its pure nature. And we don't offer anything anymore that the world doesn't offer out there. The invitation is extended to you. Um, purity is important. Maybe there's some things that have drifted in your life that has you know, maybe made you impure. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there are things that you just need some prayers for. This is a good time. It may just be some physical needs or things that you'd like your brothers and sisters to pray for you. Whatever it is now, come now as together we stand and sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray.
He went. Oh boy. Especially after last night. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. We'll start with verse 19 in just a moment. Paul's going to list some things. How many of y'all, like me, on a daily basis, <laughs> are faced with choices that you have to make? I'm not saying they necessarily had to be major things, but that are, are choices between right and wrong or, or good or evil. Or maybe have maybe a particular thing that you struggle with that it's an everyday affair that you've got to try to beat and keep, keep suppressed and kick down. Paul's going to talk about this. In fact, I want us to look at the passage over in Romans 2 that we looked at when we were in Romans. This, this two part of us, <laughs> this flesh and this spirit, are in a, are in a constant state of, of war. Um, and it's hard sometimes, especially when you're living in a world that um, erodes um, your, your moral fiber to the point that you, that voice gets a little smaller. I've said this before, it, this shows how far back I can go, but I can remember some of the cartoons that I watched when I was a kid. It was Bugs Bunny, or I remember Fred Flintstone. He'd be trying to decide to do something. There'd be like a little devil on one shoulder and a little angel on the other side trying to tell him what to do. Sounds, you know, kind of corny, but that's basically what it is. You've got two voices inside saying, eh, it's no big deal. Go ahead and do it. And the other side saying, so sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, um, but that's, that's what we have to deal with. Uh, I'm going to read some here, and then we're going to jump over to Romans, but Paul says in verse 19, he talks about the acts of a sinful nature are obvious. Your virgin may say manifest or made known. So these things are obvious. Acts of a sinful nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, uh, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy and drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a passage, too, in James chapter 3, in verse 17 18. It's one of my favorite, too. James talks about this evil, um, selfish ambition and promotion of, of oneself, and how dangerous it is. Let, let's talk just a little bit, though, and then, then I'm going to jump over to another passage. Some of these, again... Um, we like to itemize or maybe prioritize sin. You know, some of the sexual immorality, let's face it, in the world today, um, you can just about pick your, pick your sexual immorality um, out of a hat. Uh, there's just not a lot of <laughs> standard anymore as far as what's um, acceptable as far as God's will is concerned. And even for that, you know, even for that matter, if you think about God's... Um, perfect plan as far as uh, a man and a woman and sex and their relationship in marriage, how that has become made uh, adulterated and impure. Um, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, either one, the, the whole idea there, God gave us that as, a, as something as a good and perfect gift. And once again, the devil wades in and he makes it into something that is vile and, and impure. It, it started out good and then he gets a hold of it, and people get a hold of it, and they turn it into something that's bad. In fact, even turn it into something to the point that they start looking at the, the, the perfect part and the perfect way that it was given as something that's wrong. It's just flip-flop. Impurity, we talked about that some. It's a, a debasing or an, adult, an adulteration of, of what God has given us to be pure. And we'll go back to just a minute here, too, and then we'll move on, because there's, there's a lot of stuff here. I don't know if we'll have time. Back to the religion part. What do you think, and this is, this, it's an easy question really. Why do you think there are so many versions of the Lord's church out there? Okay, 
At, at what point in time does it... Yeah, David. No. Yeah, no, you're right. I, what I'm saying, what I said in the invitation earlier, as far as the Lord's church is concerned, is there a, a pure, unadulterated Lord's church? Well, I hope so. I hope so, because if they're not, we're in, big, we're in big trouble. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of things that, that we probably don't have right. But I think God's grace will be extended to us. There are some things that, you know, Maybe we don't understand. I don't think there's anything as far as the essential nature of salvation is concerned. I'm convinced of that. The Lord's church, we've got that. I think we're good with that. There may be some things we could debate. I don't know. But not that. Um, I don't think that we have to debate anything as far as our worship is concerned or anything like that. I think, I think the Bible's pretty plain about that. But when people start making it impure is when they start wanting it, like David said, uh, I don't like that, I'm going to take that out, and I'm either going to substitute this for it, or I'm just going to leave it out altogether. So when, it start, when you start doing that, then, then the Lord's church is not pure anymore. It has to be that. It has to be something that, was, that continues to be pure, because if, if you start um, making it something that it was never intended to be, not only does it lose its, its punch and its power, um, it, it causes people to be lost. It's, it's like poison. It becomes poison. And it's important for us to make sure that we try to maintain as best we can. And here's, here's, where would you find, if you want to have the Lord's church in its purity, where do you get that example? Yeah. First century. I mean, if you want to restore or maintain the ancient order of the Lord's church, that's the only place you've got to go. And if you go somewhere else, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. Can there be any, any better guideline than going back to the first century, first Christians? Is there any better guideline than that? So it, it's very dangerous. Yeah, Jonathan? Okay, Janet. Yeah, maybe. Maybe tw at the top. And the reason I wanted to say that before we move on to some of these other things, Paul, remember, his whole gist here and even in the books we studied before was, you people are adulterating. In fact, they were going back to the old law and adulterating the new law. They were going back to something God had planned before to bring them to the new law and going back to it. So uh, it's important for us to understand here, he's, he's talking about maintaining a purity too, um, just with our bodies, yes, but also... I think the Lord's church too. Yeah, Jonathan. I was just going to say that I think a lot of times too is, um, I think if anybody starts out as not necessarily purposefully uh, intending to do something contrary to how it should be done, but gradually, rather gradually over time, it becomes an unwillingness to call out or to condemn the behaviors in private life. Yeah. Uh, and then an unwillingness to want to, to condemn that lifestyle, condemn those choices. We just kind of, you know, people over time just got to be more accepting of something. We didn't necessarily say, well, we're going to pull this out, but maybe they were placed emphasis on. You're right. Yeah, once something has evolved to a point, if you if you try then to correct it, it it's it's usually pretty bad. Um, whereas if you had tried to, uh, I know <laughs> in the line of work I've been in for for many years, you know, maintaining something and making sure it's taken care of is the way to extend its life. Or you can just let it go and it's going to lay down on you, and and then you just run around and put out fires all the time. There has to be a maintenance in the Lord's church. You know, you're always constantly being vigil of making sure that you've maintained your purity. 
And this is something that has to be done in an individual Christian's life and in the Lord's church, and the elders here are taxed with that, that responsibility to make sure because uh, I, I've said this a million times. I know you'll probably get tired of me saying this, but the church is always just one generation away from apostasy, always. You're just one step away from that. It, it just, it's so easy to do. He talks about debauchery right after he talks about sexual immorality and impurity. Debauchery, and I looked this up because it's an old word, it's an old English word, self-indulgence and sensual pleasure. Do you think we live in a world of self-indulgence? Go back to what David said earlier, a lot of people depart from the true faith for self-indulgence. You know, I don't like that. Um, I'm going to indulge myself in something that I do like. That can be spiritual. Um, it can be other things. If you give yourself over to anything, it could be something, like I said before, it could be good. God intended it to be good. Uh, they old saying too much of even a good thing is not a good thing. So self-indulgence um, is a problem uh, because if, and I guess it just goes with the two words. If, if I'm indulging myself and everything, there's, there's something that's going to go hand in hand. If, if I'm constantly dwelling on what Lee wants to do and indulging my own self and my own desires, what happens to other people? What happens to God? So it's, it's a selfish, it's a, it's a really deep part of being selfish. And of course, debauchery carries along with the idea too of um, self-indulgence in sensual pleasures, which again, we live in a world, uh, <laughs> it's usually around Christmas time, but you can see them all the time. Some of the commercials, uh, and of course advertisers figured this out a long time ago, um, if you're wanting to sell, whether it's beer or cigarettes or whatever else, what, what, what's the old advertising term? What sells? Sex sales. Throw, throw some of that in there. Uh, and it can be anything. I mean, I've seen commercials for things that even adult diapers that, that, that they were trying to use the, the sex term. I'm like, well, that's weird. Uh, but the, at, the, at the end of the day, somebody... At a, at a advertising firm somewhere, sit down. They studied a demographic. They studied a group. I'm telling you, they do this now. They don't. They just don't throw stuff out there accidentally, and they determine that we need to throw this in there, and that's probably going to raise our sales. That's why they make money. Um, some of the things that uh, that I, I I go I go walk every day. Sometimes I walk up and down our road. Sometimes it's dangerous. I get run over by a truck or a tractor, so I um, go to the park. Um, there's a lot of sights to see at the park, a lot of sights. Uh, especially this time of year, there's, there's lots of sights to see. Uh, <laughs> modesty uh, is, and I'm not saying this is a, a debauchery thing, but I guess they could go hand in hand. Um, uh, modesty anymore is not... Not so, not, not so much anymore, not so modest anymore. Uh, there are things that I know I can remember when my sister, she was a teenager, I was a lot younger than her, but I can remember many, many times. Um, and it, you'd think after a while she'd find a figure out that I'm not going get, to get by dad, but she'd come down like, even on a Sunday morning or whatever, and she'd have on a short skirt or something, dad would say, Whoosh! back up the steps. And she'd go up the steps and off she'd go. She'd come back down. I saw her one time, she did it twice, came down with a different color, like the color was going to matter. And that's back up, You're making us late. Uh, there has to be, listen, y'all, I'm first to say that, you know, culture and, and norms can transition over time. But I do know this. Regard, and there are things that, that women would wear today, or men either one, that in the first century, if you wore it, they'd, they would have stoned you to death. So, that, but, are, but are modest today. So I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, though, whether it's 1st century or 21st century, uh, women or girls, if you sit down and your dress you got on don't cover your tail, your dress is too short. That would have been 1st century or 21st century. Sorry, that's just the way it is. It's a terrible thing to say. And uh, especially, you know, where the Lord's church is concerned. And I see young men doing the same kind of stuff, wearing stuff. Uh, you know, I'm old, but um, a young man walking around with his pants down around his ankle and his underwear showing, do. Don't come looking for a job for me. Uh, but again, you know, uh, underwear, there's a, there's a reason why it's called underwear. The name 
It says it all. It's to be worn under something. So if you can see it, it's not underwear. But that's a whole other whole other matter. I'm just saying sometimes the, the immodesty kicks into some of this. Idolatry, you can make anything an, an idol. Easily done. It's done all the time. Uh, Paul, you know, he was dealing with things that were actual, like idols, whether it would have been um, some of the Corinthians uh, worship different pagan deities and stuff. But today, you know, idols could be anything. It could be a person. It could be money. It could be your job. I, I know some folks that their job was what they worshipped. They, and when it came to a time to retire, or maybe them even being let go, their identity and everything was tied up in that, and they just didn't fare very well. So uh, you can make anything your idol. Anything that substitutes or supplants God as your God is your idol. And it can be done. It's done, it's done a lot. So idolatry, witchcraft, um, especially in the first century, there were a lot of uh, people that professed that. There's some that even do today um, or worship of, of nature. Uh, there's a very popular movement right now, and I think it comes from ancient Babylon, Zoroaster, Zoroaster worshiping. It's a it's kind of a witchcraft thing, but that's actually gained some. Is that that's yeah? That's actually pretty popular in this country now. So any of those things, but now let's jump over a little bit, and I want to talk about some of the other things that he he's mentioned. He talked about hatred, dissensions, factions, discord, jealousy, envy, fits of rage. I read somewhere the other day where Tennessee is the number one state for road rage now. Go read that. They're coming out here shooting everybody. Yeah, number one. Well, even four or five years ago, I read where Tennessee was the angriest state in the union. That was like four, four, Alabama was number two, and Tennessee they were fighting it out. Um, but fits of rage. Um, now go back and remember, Paul's writing this to Corinthians, to uh, not Corinthians, the Galatians, the Galatians church. saw this. This was right on Castle Lights Avenue where it, it uh, tees into Franklin Road there. Two girls, I guess one of them maybe thought the other one was, was tailgating too close. I don't know. It wasn't an accident, but I was behind them and Cindy took her with them and they were they were, I, they were about that close to you know, coming to, coming to blows. But they were calling every, I mean, screaming and hollering. Definitely a fit of rage. Seeing somebody especially if you know they're a Christian. I saw this once, true story. It's out in front of the airport. A guy getting in a screaming match with a guy in front of him there on ticketing level, and on the back of his, of his, his bumper sticker, um, he had a bumper sticker, um, smile, Jesus loves you, or I'm like, okay. Um, so if you, like I said, if you're going to put something like that on your car, make sure that you live up to it. But screaming and hollering, if you see a member of the Lord's Church out there doing that, um, if somebody, better than that, what if somebody outside, not a member of the Lord's Church, see somebody here at Berea doing that? What's the impact there? Why do you think Paul even lists that here? Why do you think he throws fits of rage in with all this other stuff? Yeah, it belongs there. Um, as, as members of the Lord's Church, of all the people in the world today that ought to have more self-control and keep themselves and their bodies and their mouths in subjection, that's us. If, if we're constantly out there and all we can do is run our mouth and, and, and have fits of rage or be angry all the time, people see that. You know where else they see that? Everywhere. So if all they see in you is an angry, rage-filled person all the time, I don't, I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of that. I can see that at work or, you know, at the ball game. Most of, our, most of my parents are pretty good. We had a game last night, though, and we got... One of my parents, I said, say something to one of them. Most of them are pretty good. Last, uh, we played last night. We finally just had to call the game 12-12 to 12 tie because we, nobody would win. It's like nobody wanted it. Uh, but, it was, but, you know, these are like six or seven-year-old boys, but, wow, some of the parents, it's like, you know, the NCAA World Series or something. They're running their mouth. And one little guy out there is the umpire. I think they're just training him, bless his heart. He made a couple of bad calls, and it's like, whoa. Uh, sadly, usually the mothers. This age, maybe it's that. I don't know. But um, if you're out in public, y'all, um, make sure you don't fall into this condemnation. Don't, don't let other people out there. 
see you have thrown a fit and having a throw down or something. And I've seen this before too. My sister, she's worked at Fakes and Hooker for since I guess it was established back during the Civil War. But for a long time she struggled because there was a there was several of the customers there at Fakes and Hooker. Um, they were building houses and stuff, and they were they were members of the Lord's Church. Um, in fact, went to church with a couple of them, and um, they'd call down there and they'd call her every name under the sun, scream and holler over the phone, and um, <laughs> she she told me she says I find it very difficult um, when one of them have talked to me like that on Thursday or Friday to go sit and I'll torm them on Sunday. That's hard to do. I said, do not blame you. That's what, that's what you got to be careful. The fits of rage, the reason it's included here, be careful of that. Discord, um, dissensions, faction, and discord. We'll throw that all in there together. Uh, we know that um, God does not like the discords, and he doesn't like brothers and sisters showing sowing seeds of discord or, or dissension. It gets back to that, What are you going? are you going to promote something that's pure and unadulterated, or you want your own way, and you're going to be constantly sowing seeds of discord. In the workplace, it's just like a church. If you've been in any kind of leadership role or supervisory role, one of the most difficult things to do at work is to have somebody in your workforce constantly going around causing trouble, but you can never put your finger on it because they're always doing it you know, behind the scenes or sneaky or crafty about it. It will absolutely drag down the entire workforce. The same thing happens in the Lord's church. You got people running around behind the scenes and they're constantly this all the time. Things, well, why are they doing it? Here's something else, too. I had a lesson on this one time. If you find yourself talking about the Lord's church here at Berea in like a second or third person, in other words, it, when you talk about Berea to other people, the, the term should be we, we at Berea. If you find yourself starting to say, well, why are they doing that down there? And this is where you worship. Watch it. Be careful, because it's not they. If you're worshiping here, it's we. So if you find you start using the other pronoun, there's trouble there, because if you start using they, what have you automatically done to yourself? You've separated yourself from the body. That's what you've done. In your mind, you've done it. I, you know, I've been guilty of that. Well, I don't know why they did that. Why they did what? You're here too. You know, you're either with us or you know, one or the other. So... The discord thing, it can creep in. Factions begin with that. I asked earlier, why are there so many versions of the Lord's church? Why are there so many factions? Pride, uh, self-indulgence, um, just unhappy with, with whatever. We've got to make sure, too, y'all, that our children don't hear this kind of stuff. You know, don't, don't get in the car on the way home and start bad-mouthing you know, the song service or the lesson or whatever. Don't do, that. don't do that. They don't need to hear that because they pick up on that. You know, if they... They see you here and you're, you know, all lovey-dovey with your brothers and sisters, and then you get in the car and you start bad-mouthing them. Bad, real bad. Uh, p- kids, kids are pretty smart. They pick up on that selfish ambition. Again, go back to James chapter 3. Um, self-promotion is dangerous anywhere because, again, it goes back to that selfish pride thing. I'm going to put myself out in front of everybody else. Just complete opposite of what Christ did. Anything that, that, that you see yourself doing or other people doing that falls under the, 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 this category of, of self-ambition or self-promotion, that is, is, is totally alien to Jesus Christ's doctrine as anything possibly could be. It's complete. It, it, if, there was, if there's a, a black and a white, that's it. So, you know, if, if you find yourself, you know, doing that, or maybe aligning yourself with somebody who does, that is as unchristian as it can be. I'm telling you, Bob, that's Bible. If, if Christ had that same attitude, we'd all be lost. Um, he was not a self-promoter. Um, he had no selfish ambition. In fact, it was about, he emptied himself. He left heaven, he emptied himself and became like one of us. So when you see this, especially in the Lord's church, there's no place for this. Um, Pride and this selfish ambition, self-promotion, is the, the next thing that will fall after that will be the seeds of discord, dissensions, and factions. Every time, if you've got somebody like that and their personality is strong enough, 
The next thing that will happen, Will, there will be a split, and there will be discord, and there will be dissensions. Every time you can take to the bank. So it's why, it's why it's so important for us to understand that too. I'm going to go to Romans right quick. We're not going to have time to look at the good stuff, don't look like. Maybe we will. I love this passage in Romans because I can identify with it so much. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 14, I'm going to read just a little bit. And again, this is Paul trying to get the first century Christians to understand the difference between the law and, and Christ's law. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. You know, I can actually identify with that. There have been times I have done something, and, and, and later on, to myself say, why in the world, why in the world did I do that? I'm better than I used to be, but when I was a younger man, there were several times I'd do something, and after I was picking myself up off the floor, I'd think, why did I say that? No. There are certain things that you, that you just, you know now. I understand what I do. For what I would want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Have you ever done something? Maybe it's something, and everybody has a different weakness. Some of us may share, I don't know, but and the good side of you, that spiritual side of you is telling you don't do that, don't do that, but you do it anyway. If you've still got just a smidgen of conscience and it hadn't been seared to the, to the bone, how does it make you feel? Yeah, rotten. Yeah, That thing that I don't want to do, I do, that's what I'm doing, I do it. Now Paul struggles with this. He has some things, I think, his thorn in the flesh was something like this. I think there was something that he struggled with, and he, he just, it was, it was that part of him that he had to constantly be at battle with. So, yeah, you, you feel bad once you do it. And how many of you ever, like me, have ever told God, well, I'm never going to do that again. If you'll just forgive me, I won't do that again. And then time goes on. There you are, doing it again. And I won't ever do that again. You know, here's the deal, and, and it, again, it's applicable to us. Um, how many times are you supposed to forgive your brothers and sisters? Yeah. So, that's hard. You know, when Paul talks about, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he gives all the characteristics of love. The one that always impressed me the most there, that he talks about, was that love believes all things. That's a big, that's a big thing. To believe all things? You mean in spite of everything that I'm looking at, every fact, and every historical thing that I know about this person, what they've done in the past, if I love them, I'm supposed to believe what they're telling me now? Yeah. How hard is that? I'm going to tell you. i got some folks in my life. That's tough. Uh, and then they go and they do something, and you knew they were going to do it. And then they come back to the well again a little bit later, and then love believes all things. Wow, that's a big, that's a, that's tough. But let me go back to this when I said earlier. If you've got a personal chink or whatever in your spiritual armor, and there's something that you continue to do over and over again, and you go back to God's will and you say, God, I, I'm sorry, won't do that again. Do you want him to believe you? I want him to believe me. Do you think he knows you're probably not going to do that? Probably not. <laughs> but I'm just telling you. And, and, and I think we need to get a better handle of that because sometimes we get down on ourselves because we have to think we've got to be this perfect person. And then when you, and you're not that, and, and it does disappoint God. But you've got to understand the grace factor of that too. He knows. He knows. Jesus Christ knows. Why do you think he came here and lived like one of us? So he could understand. So he'd know. He'd know. So, again, what Paul's saying here is something we can all identify with. And if I, mm, for what I would not do, I do. But I, what I hate, I do. This is verse 16. And if I do what I, this is kind of confusing. What I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do good, but I cannot carry it out. And if you can't identify with that, you're not a human being. I mean, there are things that I know, and times past, and that door of opportunities have even closed on me on some of the things I knew I should have done, and I didn't do it, and, it, and it's gone now. So... What Paul's saying here is pretty profound. Um, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. It's really sad. You know, what Paul's saying here, he, he's trying to get us to understand that, that he struggles with this too. 
but he's trying to get them to fully appreciate the law can't fix that for you. The old law can't, they, it won't cover you anymore. He's trying to get them to understand that here and even in Romans. Um, for what I do uh, now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. He calls it a law here. Spiritual absolute. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For, the inner, for my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I, need, I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God for Lord Jesus Christ. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. You go back over to Galatians and you talk about all the things that he enumerates there. And there could be a whole lot more, I guess we could. We all have things that we struggle with. The law, then and today too, I guess maybe we need to maybe make that a little more contemporary. We can't, as Christians today, see Christianity as a, as a legalistic form of religion. Does that make sense? Because that's what the law was. The law was written as a legalistic document. If you look at it, it was written um, like you would talk to a, like I'd talk to Tucker. The, the law was a, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It was just not, 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 not. It's just like you talk to a, a child. Don't do that, don't do that, that's a no-no. Now, what Paul's trying to get them to understand, and us too, is under the law of liberty, God's not going to do that anymore. He doesn't need to go down and enumerate everything that we, we should not do. He tells us what we should do, and that takes away all the other stuff. So as, as mature Christians, and as, I guess as a human race in these last days, God's not going back to that anymore. So folks that seem to be determined to want to go back and bind elements of the law, old law, even today, there's lots of folks out there that want to do that even today, they have missed the entire, the entire crux of the gospel. And they profess to be Christians. They still want to go back and talk about that kind of stuff. So, again, it's important for us to understand the law is dead. Christians under the new law, the law of Christ. I do have time to talk about some of this. Well, just briefly, I'll, let's go to verse 22. Now he's going to make a contrast here from all the stuff that he just said in the previous two verses. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Paul keeps mentioning the, the provoking and the envious thing here. Um, these guys, these self-promoters that had drifted into the Galatian church, um, Anybody who's a self-promoter is always going to promote that jealousy and envy aspect. They've got to because the very nature of what they're, of the, what they're doing, that's, that's the essence of it. If they've got to be the center of everything, that's what they're going to be. It's always going to be an envious situation. Why is envy wrong and pride? And go all the way back to the very beginning, even before we were here. Um, what was the devil's sin? What was Satan's sin? Pride and envy. Yeah, you know, it, you talk about, I've heard lessons before, even had one one time that, you know, when um, Cain killed Abel being the first sin, that's not true. First, the first sins were pride and envy and self-promotion. The devil was going to promote himself over God because he was envious of his position and his pride um, caused him to do, try, try just that. So why does Paul keep going back to this well? Because... It's pretty, it's pretty old. It's, they're the oldest. Love, of course, we'll talk about that maybe some more next week. Gentleness, kindness, good self-control would be just the opposite of, of fits of rage. Self-control is a, it's a, it's a hard thing, especially when you're trying to control yourself over things that you naturally have a, a weakness about. And I don't know what your, your personal weakness is. If you're like me, you've got more than one. But... I'm telling you, everybody has them, and it can be any number of things, um, some kind of addiction, um, you know, I don't know, maybe it could be covetousness, maybe some type of sexual immorality, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I guarantee you the devil knows what they are, 
because that's what he's that's that's the hand he's going to play you. God knows what they are too. So self control becomes one of those things that has to be constantly. We have to constantly remind ourselves. Uh, I try to every morning, or every sometimes it's later on in the day. Depends on what time Tucker gets up. Try to, as part of my my reading the Bible, try to examine some of the things that I did maybe the day before. Does that make sense? Sometimes I go to bed and I, I, I fall asleep, and I just most of the time I fall asleep in the chair in the den first, but. Um, so a lot of times it's the next morning, and I can think about maybe things I did or said the day before. Here's why it's important, y'all, to do that. If you don't do that, and of course sometimes if you don't do that, your wife will remind you of the things you did the day before. That's okay. Um, you can't correct bad behavior unless you look at yourself honestly, unless you have a wife pointed out to you. Uh, look at yourself honestly because there's no way to correct it. Does that make sense? If you keep letting day after day go by and you never really look at yourself and say, you know, maybe I shouldn't have said that or maybe I should have done this different. And it may not be anything wrong. You may look at it and say, well, you know, I did the best I could there. But if you do that and you do it regularly, you can find yourself making some corrections. There are some things that over time now, I don't, um, things that I used to do that, that I think negatively impacted people that um, I'm better at now. Uh, because I've tried to look at myself honestly, and then that's hard to do. Um, look yourself in the mirror. Don't forget who who you look like. And there are some things too that I weren't, I was not doing that I should have been doing. And the only way you're going to improve that um, is to is to look at yourself every now and then. Uh, and don't. Here's the other thing: we're not to compare ourselves among ourselves. As long as you compare yourself to the perfect standard, you'll always come out. You'll always come out okay. Never make it, but you'll always come out okay. But I think it's important too. We'll talk about some of these qualities here next week. But self-examination, being able to look at yourself in light of the scriptures, read a passage. How many of y'all like me have ever read a passage of scripture? And depending on the state of mind you're in, or maybe what your day was like, whatever, the passage you read feels like it was just exactly what you needed to hear. Pretty weird, huh? Now, I don't know if that's just our mind seeing it in a different light, or it's actually, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's, um, it's, the, only, it's the only written word that you'll ever read that'll do that. Yeah, Janet. Holy Spirit, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, and if you've never picked your Bible up and had that happen to you, pick your Bible up more. <laughs> because um, it has straightened me out a lot of times. It's even I've even read it before on things that had never even dawned on me, and I read it, and I'm like, you know, I might ought to, I might ought to do something about that. Um, there might be somebody that I need to go talk to now. Or so. so it's just important for us to do that. And we'll talk about self-examination a little bit next week, next week too. Anybody have any, anything else? Anybody else come to mind that we need to need to pray for? We do have a lot of folks that are sick. Um, Mother's Day. Sunday, mother, stepmother, grandmother. Yeah, Jane. We are taking care of our great grandson, four and six years old. Um, six year old is in kindergarten, and four years old, four year old goes to the daycare. Um, we're with them either in the morning. In the work, mm -hmm. um, the parents are one day here, the next day, one day with mom, one day with dad, one day with mom, one day with <coughs> off. Um, those children are just being needed on a wonderful day. And they really need that prayer. Okay. That's pretty common. I, um, I'll say this. Um, 
the little ball team I'm coaching, first thing I picked up when I got my roster, half the kids on there, their last name is different from their parents' name. So there's a difference there. And um, <laughs> some of their conduct and um, their language, especially with two little boys, I think they know now that I don't want to listen to that. Um, when you see that, um, these boys and their families there, they're just it's definitely all walks of life, that's for sure, and different types of people. Um, I always um, have, um, it's usually after our, our practice game, we, I get them all together there, we have us a prayer, um, we do our little Go Novas thing, and, um, and most of them now, they're, they're, they're used to that. They, they know the first the time we did it, they're like, well, why are we doing this? So, yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Anybody have anything else? Would y'all bow with me? Dear Lord, thank you for being with us tonight, giving us the time to spend together and study your word. As we leave this place, dear Lord, help us to have it dwell in our hearts and be better people for your service. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And here comes the troops. <laughs>